if we don't look closely enough, we won't treat the patient for what they're really experiencing. And I always say treat the patient, not the lab value. So don't just treat whatever you're seeing on a piece of paper. Treat what's actually bothering them because that's when they're really going to get the benefit of treatment. Family building is supposed to be easy, and it can be a shock when it's not. The roller coaster ride of infertility can be a mix of emotions and conflicting advice along the way. As a reproductive endocrinologist and former fertility patient, I not only help patients build families every day, but I remember what the ride was like for me. Hang on tight as we learn together from experts and share stories from infertility warriors with compassion. I'm your host, Dr. Laura Shaheen, and this is Baby or Bust. Women can suffer in pain for years before getting a diagnosis. They can believe friends, family, and even doctors that tell them that painful periods and pain with intercourse are just part of being a woman. And they can even stop asking for help. As a fertility doctor, I see patients in my own practice who are surprised when I ask them more about their pain. I offer solutions and don't dismiss their symptoms. Today, we are speaking with chronic pelvic pain specialist, Dr. Sonia Balani, to help shatter stigma around pelvic pain and help listeners learn how to advocate for the care that they need. Sonia, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Sonia? Is pain normal? No. I'm going to say that point blank because I think as a society, we have this stigma where painful periods are normal. Everyone has pain during their periods, right? Just like everyone has pain the first time they have sex, right? Wrong. This idea of pain has just kind of been ingrained in our society as almost a sense of normalcy. Like if you have pain, that's okay. Oftentimes in certain cultures too, it's built into like our culture. Oh yes, you have pain with the first time that you have sex. So that means you're a virgin. So that's a good thing. You know what I mean? So there's so many different ways we kind of process this aspect of pain. But I would say that if you're experiencing pain, it absolutely should be evaluated and treated because there's so many different options. Yeah, you touched on this, but why why are we taught that pain is normal and okay and just to expect it? I was actually reading this book on pain recently. It was like a pain textbook. And it went back into like the 1800s when women would experience pain and they were considered witches. And I know that it sounds ridiculous, but I mean, you think about it, it actually stems from like a very long time where patients who experienced pain were considered histrionic. They were considered psychosomatic. They had like a spirit in them. So I think it's almost like just ingrained in our society that if you don't accept pain, then it's abnormal, then you're abnormal. And I see so many patients that do have pain and that have tried to speak to their doctors. And one of the most common things as a fertility doctor that I'm I'm asking question about, I'm thinking about in the back of my head is really endometriosis. And it can take on average seven to eight years of symptoms, meaning painful periods before people actually get a diagnosis. I have patients that I am asking questions, you know, okay, do you have painful periods? And they sort of say, well, yes, but of course that's normal. I'd like to know what you ask your patients and how you kind of get them to characterize what is normal, I'm putting in air quotes, and not normal. Whenever a patient sits down in my office, it's like this conversation where I almost have to like start from the beginning. You have to break it down into smaller pieces because so much of this, our bodies can only process pain in a certain way. If you have painful periods, kind of painful, but not so painful because you have a lot of pain when you place a tampon or a lot of pain when you have sex. You're not processing the pain in the same way, like our prefrontal cortex, that word, or basically our brains, right? It can only process so much pain. So as clinicians, as physicians, we often miss things. When you break it down, you realize that, wait a minute, this person might have been suffering for a long time from something like endometriosis, but they weren't so focused on their painful period because they were having so much pain when they were placing a tampon that that got missed. So I think 
sitting down and kind of breaking down our questions into like small segmented pieces so that people can realize that it's not necessarily normal and that their symptoms should be taken more seriously. Because I think for a certain aspect of it, it's taken as if it's okay. So that always happens. So don't worry about it. Let's move on from there until it becomes a larger issue eight years from now. Yeah, I had a patient in my office just last week. She's coming to me because she's been trying for a year to conceive. And I just sort of asked you, open question, tell me about your periods. Are they painful? Yes. Have you ever been evaluated? Well, I've talked to doctors about it before, but they always said it was normal. And I said, the one question that's really helped me and helps patients stop a minute and think is I say, does the pain ever limit you from doing activities that you want to do? Yep. Yes, 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 yes. And they're like, what? And I'm like, well, I mean, have you ever had to miss school because of it? And or miss a day of work or missed out on a, you know, concert that you really wanted to go to because you're in so much pain. And when they say, yeah, that actually happens almost every period or even ever. Okay, that is a sign. Let's talk about this more. They've actually sometimes been thrown this diagnosis of endometriosis just because they have pain, but they haven't actually been evaluated for other sources of pain, understanding that endometriosis normally doesn't occur alone, to be honest. So it often occurs in conjunction with other diagnoses. We're so focused on pain and pain being endopain, they don't actually get worked up for all these other things going on. But it takes them so long to even get an appropriate diagnosis because they've just been thrown a diagnosis that they don't even really understand what's going on. And so we should just clarify what endometriosis is. It is an inflammatory disorder in which tissue that is very similar to the lining of the uterus that you usually shed with a menstrual cycle is found elsewhere in the body, like Um, in your pelvis, on top of your uterus, on your ovaries, and, you know, even through your intestines, just all over. And when hormone changes happen, especially around the time of your period, you can have significant pain. And so the typical light bulb is very painful periods and often infertility. I had a patient come to my office and she said to me, you know what, Dr. Balani, I have a lot of pain when the doctor ever, when the doctor places a speculum, I have pain with sex. I have pain with my periods, but I have endo and it's all endo and, that, and that's what's going on. So, you know, it's, it's okay though, because I, I treat with Motrin and, and I can make it work, right? And she's like, but you know what really bothers me? this urgency, this frequency. I go to the bathroom all the time. I feel like I'm not emptying my bladder. So that's endo, right? And I'm like, well, maybe, but, you know, maybe we're missing something here. What we're talking about is like holistic care. And, you know, people use that term and they kind of roll their eyes and they're like, ah, but it's really important to look at a person as an entire person. Because otherwise, you know, when you get to your part where you're looking at their infertility and their image and all these other factors that go into it, what's the similarity between all these different diagnoses? Inflammation. They could have been diagnosed six years earlier, and perhaps they could have had something else done. You know what I mean? And I just always like to think of effective management strategies. So to me, it's just so key. And you know, that story I was just telling you where she said, oh, well, I have endo and all my urinary symptoms are secondary to endo too. Well, think about what happens when you have endometriosis and you're in pain. What does your body do? You clench, right? You tighten because you're in pain because that's it's almost like clenching your jaw, like people clench their jaw when you're in pain. So your bladder contracts and your pelvic floor doesn't fully relax. So you don't completely empty your bladder. You leave a little bit of urine in your bladder. So you got to go to the bathroom. You got to go to the bathroom. But if someone's just solely focused on the endo and not that connection between the endometriosis and their pelvic floor, they're never going to get full relief from their symptoms. They might not even realize that it's possible, but it is. I believe that patients really know their own bodies. I've had patients walk into my office and tell me that they were having painful sex since they had started having sex and their OBGYN said to them, "Eh, it's no big deal. Use some lubricant. It'll go away after, you know, after a little while. Maybe it's your partner. Have a glass of wine. Have a glass of wine. You have a low pain threshold. Get rid of your anxiety. You know, (laughs) like, I mean, it's your fault. It's your fault. You did this. It's 
I mean, mind boggling, but it's also disheartening to realize that that's kind of like a field that we're working in when we know that that's not the right answer. So number one, I would tell patients, you know your body. If you get an answer that just doesn't feel right, or number two, that's really like gaslighting behavior where you're like, that's not really nice. That's not really an appropriate thing to say to someone. Seek a second opinion. Number two, I think there is nothing wrong for searching for answers. Think about what happens if you're sitting in an exam room and someone tells you your pain isn't real or what you're feeling doesn't count. Aren't you going to look for someone else to treat you? Like, absolutely. And the problem is that this happens. And then what happens eight years later? They walk into your office, Laura, and they're like, I can't get pregnant. And I told my doctor eight years ago that I was having issues with my period and that I was having pain with sex. But Everyone just said that was normal. So now what? Unfortunately, I've also seen a real racial bias in this realm. I've had a patient within the last week who was black, has talked to multiple doctors, and has just been absolutely dismissed just never felt like her symptoms were taken seriously. And she's probably right. It has a lot to do with this racial bias that black people feel pain differently or different ethnicities feel things differently. Have you ever found that in your practice? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's so tough because number one, pain is often misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, stigmatized. So you have that to begin with. So you already have a population of patients, regardless of race, that's just treated inappropriately. And then you add the component of racial disparities to it. It's really, really scary, to be honest with you. It's really scary because just as a medical community, we've failed certain populations of patients. And I think what we've done is created an injustice in our system system do do a multitude of things. And so, and pain just magnifies that. What are just some general ways that you think about the patient walks in and they say, I'm just in pain all the time. What do you do? Yeah. So number one, I think the biggest thing that we can give patients is our time. Because if we're not listening, if we're not present, then we're going to miss something. So, you know, I'll start off. I'll say, okay, tell me your story. When did the pain start? Did it start? For some people, the pain started when they're 12. I mean, I think I my youngest patient is 13 years old. We often see it occurs with like childhood patterns. You know, in medicine, we use these mean words, things like dysfunctional voiders and stuff like that. But you see children with certain behaviors are more likely to develop certain pain syndromes as young adults. And then I want to know specific questions. How many times a day do you pee? Because some people will be like, oh, I'm, it's totally fine. I pee like every 45 minutes. Totally normal, right? Well, no. How many do you wake up at night to pee? Oh, yeah. It was just three times. Everyone wakes up three times. And then you start to put the picture together when you get your period, does it hurt? Oh, yeah, I can't go to school ever. Like, but no one really goes to school during their period. Okay. Do you wear tampons? No, I could never put in a tampon. I mean, I can't even handle a speculum exam. So, you know, you start to see how all of these things have probably been present, probably been missed. Oftentimes when we're treating pain syndromes, there's no magic pill. There's no magic potion. There's no magic injection that I can do or surgery that's going to fix this. I will always end my conversations with patients with saying, so tell me what bothers you the most, because you'd be surprised. They can have all of this pain Yet it's the persistent urgency in their bladder that really drives them nuts. I do a lot of work with interstitial cystitis, which is essentially pain in the bladder. And it's also called the evil twin of endometriosis. Certain studies will suggest that around 70% of patients who have the diagnosis of endo also have a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. And we don't really understand why they occur together, but we kind of do because of what you said in the first minute that we were talking, which is inflammation. When you walk around with inflammation, it's not like you see it in your face. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things where it can occur insidiously, it can occur over time, it can worsen over time. My point is that if we don't don't look closely enough, we won't treat the patient for what they're really experiencing. Treat the patient, not the lab value. So don't just treat whatever you're seeing on a piece of paper. Treat what's actually bothering them because that's when they're really going to get the benefit of treatment. You talk about, you know, thinking about someone holistically and thinking about their nutrition and their exercise and kind of focusing on one thing at a time. And it often will uncover other issues. I think Western medicine is so fixated on 
figuring out the problem and then fixing it. You know, it's like high blood pressure, give a pill. Right. As opposed to being like, wait, why is the high blood pressure there anyway? Like, could it be the obesity or the smoking? Or, of course, there's underlying family issues. I really enjoy how you think about it. And I want people to hear that there's other things than just surgery and birth control pills for pain. Modern medicine as we know it, like you said, is right now just so focused on fixing. Yes, we're allopathic doctors. Can we go to the OR and fix? Sure. Can we give you a medicine? Absolutely. Can we give you an injection? Sure. But we're what we lack is number one, prevention. How do we prevent these things from coming back? Number two, it leaves patients with unmet needs, right? So you wonder why people go searching on Google for supplements or other things. You have left them with an unmet need. And and that's where we have to kind of change the paradigm, change the conversation. So what supplements actually work for this, right? Because there's a ton and there's some that actually do have data on them. So let's talk about it. What foods are actually going to be good for you? Like, and why does that work? And I think if we actually arm patients with the right tools and, and, and the right ways to like treat, but then also prevent then they're not going to end up in our offices every, you know, three months or something looking for an answer. And lifestyle modifications, exercises, yoga, meditation, I mean, these things have value. And to be honest, even in at least the world of pain, and, and you can tell me more about infertility, but in the world of pain, there's data behind this stuff. There's such an overlap between mind and body. And we are Western trained allopathic doctors with white coats. And that narrative is give a pill and don't call me complaining if it doesn't work. And then you go to social media, which you and I are both very active on. And, and there are companies and people that are selling certainty. Your doctor won't listen to you. We'll take this supplement and you're going to feel all better. And then it's just all oh, the poor patients that get stuck in yeah. the middle. There's also people out there that practice very dogmatically. So they'll say, if it's not in the data, if it's not in science, then it doesn't occur. And the truth is that science is constantly changing. We're always, I mean, you know, we used to not do things on 16-year-olds that we now do. You know what I mean? So that kind of thinking is very um, is very backwards to me because we're never going to grow as doctors in medicine if we don't think outside the box. Find doctors that are going to at least listen to what you read online, not completely shut you down, you know, have more of a conversation rather than be dogmatic, which is what you just said. People always talk about like, especially with pain, certain breathing techniques, right? And so uh, there's a lot of doctors out there that'll say, yeah, that doesn't really make sense. Who cares how you breathe? That doesn't have anything to do with it. But if you look at anatomically what happens when people take shorter breaths, you actually decrease the lateral excursion of your ribs, right? So when you decrease that, you increase intra-abdominal pressure, you increase pressure on the pelvic floor. So for someone who already has inflammatory hypertonic pelvic floor dysfunction, if they end up being anxious and they breathe differently, their pain is going to ramp up, not because it's in their head, because they're, you know, however you want to look at it, because physiologically, what are you doing? You're increasing intra-abdominal pressure. You're increasing tension in that pelvic floor. Patients are told it's all in your head. And there is an absolute association with pain and depression and anxiety. And just like there's an association between infertility and stress and anxiety and depression, like it's all interwoven. And I think it's so important to pay attention to your emotional and mental health. Number one, just coping with certain issues. You need someone on your side. And I mean, I think I think as a society, we can all use that. You know, pain, no pain, whatever. It doesn't matter. I also think there's a cycle that occurs. And we have to break that cycle. And sure, we can use medications, we can use surgeries, we can use treatments to try to break that cycle. But often that also involves rewiring the brain and rewiring how we look at pain, how we think of pain, how we perceive pain. If you really want to treat the whole person, like if you really really want to get better, start to finish, we want to use that word root cause, which everyone loves to use in this day and age, then it involves having someone on your side that understands that mental health capacity to it. I have a couple of patients a year, and it might even be more often than that, and they come to me because they're infertile. They're a new patient visit, and they're coming to me because they've been trying to conceive for over a year and they aren't pregnant. 
And one of my first questions is, okay, how long have you been trying? I used to kind of leave it at that. I am embarrassed at how many times it took me to learn how to ask more because I have missed patients that are honestly not having intercourse because they're in pain. Oh my gosh, I I wasn't even thinking of that. And then when you said that, I'm like, that makes so much sense, of course. I missed it. Well, the first patient that I realized, I went to do her IUI. And it, in doing an intrauterine insemination, you need to place a speculum. We were just unable to do it. And then we got into it. And she said, listen, I'm not actually having intercourse. I've never had sex with my husband because it's so painful. Oh, my gosh. And so I said, you know what? We've got this specimen. And so the little catheter is tiny. It's like this little soft. Right. And I said, listen, I'm, I've got this specimen. I'm just going to place it in your vagina. It's like tiny. She got pregnant. Oh, my God. That's amazing. <laughs> that's that amazing. amazing. So the first time she ever saw sperm in her vagina, she got pregnant. Yes. It is a great story. She's thrilled. She has her baby. And I learned how to ask more questions. And so now I say, okay, what does trying mean to you? I love that. Is the penis getting into the vagina, you know? And people don't even know anatomy sometimes. I usually have it in my older patients who I'll see for like various reasons. Sometimes I see them for dryness. Sometimes I see them for like menopausal changes because I do hormone stuff. It's funny because sometimes that's the last thing they want to talk about. Okay, yes, yeah, so let's focus on because I'm, I'm getting these sweats and I'm waking up at night and that and that. And so then I'll say, okay, so let's talk about sex. And I'm like, oh, I, I'm, no, I don't have sex. Like, oh. Yeah, it really bothers my partner. It's kind of bothering me too. It's affected our relationship. You know, and and then you delve deeper and you're like, well, do you want to have sex? And they're like, well, no one's ever really asked me that. I'm like, you know, I'm a total New Yorker, born and raised. So I'm like very direct. I'm like, so let's talk about sex. Are you having, are you orgasming during sex? Do you have painful orgasms? Penis and vagina, penetrative or fingering? What are you doing? Look, let's talk about it. Let's not be shy because ultimately sexual health is so important for our general health, even cardiovascularly. I mean, in so many different realms, good sex is important. I think it should be brought up at every doctor's visit, but I'm so glad you're doing it in infertility now. Like this needs to be a lecture that you give to everybody. For some of my patients, they'll get a lot of help from pelvic physical therapy. Some people don't even know that this exists. So you think about muscles in your neck, in your back, in your arms. We work them all the time, right? I mean, like for someone like you who's a surgeon, I know I get trigger points in my back and my neck, right? Just from how you stand. Guess what? You can get that stuff in your pelvic floor from clenching, from inflammation, from lots of stuff, okay? And so a pelvic floor physical therapist is a physical therapist who's not like an orthopedic physical therapist. They do things that are called myofascial release, and that's just a really fancy term for putting a finger on a trigger point and releasing it. And for vagina owners, that means putting a finger in the vagina and releasing those muscles. I love that you just said vagina owners. <laughs> You didn't say women. You didn't say females. I like that. That needs to be on a t-shirt. I am a vagina owner. Yeah, exactly. For vagina owners, that is really helpful to release those muscles just like it would be if you went for a deep tissue massage, you know? Um, but that's also where lifestyle modifications come in because what are you doing in your daily activities that continue to cause these muscles to contract? So that's where things like yoga, lengthening exercises, all that stuff comes into play. And there's a process and it's known as biofeedback. And it's essentially where they put electrodes into the pelvic floor. This doesn't hurt. I feel like the words that I use make it sound so scary, and it's not. Basically, what that does is it shows how the muscles contract during that time. So I'll give you a funny story. I was doing my fellowship in the Department of Urology with this guy, actually from San Francisco. His name uh, is David Wise. And he wrote this book. It's called A Headache in the Pelvis. And it's a very famous book for people who suffer from pelvic floor dysfunction. And David writes all about it. And, and he's a psychologist. And he's a male. And he writes about it in his book. He suffers from pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay? So he created this book. And he came to train me. So he brought his physical therapist with him, too. So he said, Sonia, you know, you're going to be referring to physical therapy when you're seeing patients with pelvic floor dysfunction. Why don't you go get examined and just to see what they do in a visit? Sure. Great. And the nerd in me wanted to use 
this thing called an allegometer, which is a pressure sensor, just to like see what was going on in my pelvic floor. And, and she goes in with the allegometer, and here I go, TMI. She's like, Dr. Bellani, you have pelvic floor dysfunction. And I was like, no, I don't. I don't have pain. I, I don't go to the bathroom a lot. Like, I don't have any symptoms. I'm totally fine. <laughs> and she's like, well, the pressure is really high and your pubococcygeus. And she's like moving it around. And I'm like, oh my God, I was completely asymptomatic. Okay. Like, I ended up having two kids. And after the fact, I started developing like some frequency and stuff. But the point is that this stuff can lay latent, right? And so you, you might not even know this is like slowly developing in your body. What is the difference between pelvic PT and Mayan abdominal massage? So that is really popular out here in the West Coast. So it's kind of like I talked about with the breathing technique. When you're breathing very shallow breaths, it can, and when you're anxious, it can increase your pelvic pain. So Mayan abdominal massage is also similar to that where it's releasing lower abdominal muscles. Abdominal muscles control your pelvic floor muscles. Is there a science behind it? Yes. I would probably say that it can absolutely be helpful. I think it can be an adjunctive therapy, which means like it can be helpful in the context of using other things. It's great to combine that with other therapies as well so to see more longevity for treatment options. I know in my practice, I've personally seen so much misdiagnosis, and I am sure that that happens to you. People come in with this diagnosis. They're convinced that they have endometriosis. Personally, the one of the most striking patients that I've seen is someone who came to me for infertility. I want to have a baby, and we're trying to get some information, heavy periods her whole life. And I'm like, okay, yeah, what's a heavy period to you? And she talks about doubling up, buying diapers for her period, and a couple of times going to the emergency room for a blood transfusion, heavy, and just kind of has asked questions has seen doctors. Finally, we do a thorough evaluation and she has incredible fibroids. And she'd been told that she had fibroids, but never went to see doctors. A lot of it was mistrust in the medical system. A lot of it was because her mother had to have a hysterectomy, her whole uterus removed for fibroids. And so in her mind, she's thinking the only treatment for this heavy bleeding is to lose my uterus and I want to have babies. And so finally, having a myomectomy, just removing the troublesome fibroids, and she went on to have her family. But that level of misunderstanding led to years of suffering. I think part of that is also because the topics that we discuss are so stigmatized that oftentimes it like we said before, patients don't necessarily want to have a conversation about it. Just like your patient right there, like it's almost like kind of like out of sight, out of mind. And so oftentimes as physicians, we miss the boat on really important diagnoses. Now I had a patient who walked into my office. She said, Dr. Bonnie, I have interstitial cystitis. And I know I do crying. I've read all about it on Reddit. I know what it is. And I'm never going to recover. I mean, people suffer their entire life and like, and she was going down a hole. When people have IC and they have that layer is disrupted, when their bladder fills, they feel like a lot of discomfort. You're not feeling when your bladder's full and you got to go and you're like really uncomfortable, except for patients with IC, it's painful. And I mean, when I say painful, it's debilitating pain. The people that come to my office are like, they're super sleuths. Like if I'm the Sherlock Holmes, like they're already there, you know, they've done their homework. They don't walk into my office without at least having Googled something or looked something up. And I said, okay, well tell me about your symptoms. You know, she's like, I go to the bathroom 30 times a day, wake up five times at night, I feel like I'm not completely emptying. I have a lot of pain with sex, with with deep penetration. Certain positions hurt me more. Examine her. It's absolutely her pelvic floor. We treat her. Within eight weeks, she's a different person. But it's so easily misdiagnosed. She had seen, I think, 18 different urologists before she came in my office. They had put her on all these overactive bladder medications. She's had hydrodistensions. I mean, she had had so much stuff based on this diagnosis when in reality, that wasn't what was going on. It's so easy to just go down a pigeonhole, especially when when someone has that diagnosis in their record. 
I don't want to have that bias. Don't you think there's so many times when you see patients and it's just inherent, like they have this diagnosis in their chart. I mean, tell me in your office, if someone walked in with endo, have you had a patient that had endometriosis, but they walked in and you gave her some simple solutions and whoa, she got pregnant, you know? And like, where did you get that diagnosis from? Like, oh, it was given to me when I was 20. Yeah. Or my mom had endometriosis and I have painful periods. Or right. a really common one is I was told I had PCOS when I was a teenager. You know, I was told I'd never get pregnant. Okay, well, what were the symptoms? And they were just having, you know, slightly irregular teenage periods and no symptoms their entire life, but they still carry that diagnosis of PCOS. It's just polycystic ovarian syndrome. Right. And so, like, misdiagnosis is so common in so many different ways, you know? And I, exactly, I'm going to sound like a, like, I, that's exactly why peeling the onion is so important, in my opinion. <laughs> How can we find you, uh, the listeners? How can they find you? So my office is in New York City, but you can find me at www.pelvicpaindoc.com. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at the same handle. Thank you so much, Sonia. I really appreciate you. Thank you. It was an honor, honestly. Thank you so much for being here today. I really enjoyed this discussion with Dr. Sonia Bellani, chronic pelvic pain specialist. I took away a very important message to not normalize pain. There are so many people that have been dismissed by their doctors, been told by friends and family that pain is normal, that pain is part of life, and may not be seeking treatment for something that can be improved. There are options out there for treatment and being an advocate for your own care and taking the time to find that provider and doctor that's gonna work with you is one step forward in finding that pain-free life. I'm Dr. Laura Shaheen and this is Baby or Bust. If you like this episode, let us know. Give us a five-star review and follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Baby or Bust is produced by Mark Ramsey, Jamie Solis, and Greg Moga. Executive produced by Paul Anderson, Nick Pinella, and Andrew Greenwood for Workhouse Media. Baby or Bust is a Mark Ramsey Media production. 